Apostolos Kumbitsis, who is currently the Protopsoti of the Transfiguration of Christ Greek Orthodox Church in Corona, New York. He began his lifelong study of the patriarchal style of chanting initially with his father and now holds a music teacher's degree from the Conservatory Musical Collegio in Thessaloniki, Greece. We thank you for having us today and for letting us conduct this interview. Thank you. Thank you for having me. The honor is mine. This is our student of Byzantine music, Titus, who is a newly baptized Orthodox Christian. We thank you for being here today. And with that, we'll have you open us with the first question. When did your interest in Byzantine music begin? So I first became interested in Byzantine music at a very young age, which is kind of a cliche amongst some of us chanters that have been around for a while. Um, my father was a priest in the Greek Orthodox Church here in America, and um, he was from Thessaloniki, and his teacher in Thessaloniki was the great Constantinos Pringos, who used to be the Archon Protopsaltis of the Ecumenical Patriarchate. So I first uh, uh, was taught by my dad, and he kind of instilled that love of Byzantine music you know, in me. Um, at four years old, I chanted my first epistle. Uh, it was the epistle of Christmas. It's the shortest one of the year. I couldn't read it four years, so I had to memorize it. So not only did I have to memorize the lyrics, you know, the words of the epistle reading, but also the melody, how to chant it. You know, my dad taught me that. Uh, by seven years old, I was doing uh, supplication services, baraklisi to the Panagia. And by 10 years old, I was doing full-blown liturgies. You know? So I was fairly young when I, when I got that. And to this day, that enthusiasm is, has only grown. What was your motivation and inspiration to continue learning? Um, my motivation, I guess, was, uh, and, and I know I repeat this to a lot of people that I have discussions with, and that is um, uh, maintaining and keeping and preserving and subsequently teaching the tradition, the hymnological tradition of the Greek Orthodox Church. Um, Byzantine music is the official musical system uh, of the church. Um, and there's a lot of, uh, we have kind of strayed away from that, especially in this country. Mm -hmm. And that, that's a whole separate, uh, uh, you know, discussion about that. But um, uh, in other words, four-part harmony with mixed men and women choirs with European music is not the music of the church. So uh, in, in my endeavor, you know, for, for what I had learned from my dad, I decided to just keep moving forward with it and said, this has to be taught. This has, you know, people need to know certain things. Um, and uh, sometimes you make friends, other times they don't want to hear, you know. Mm -hmm. Uh, what you have to say, but but my motivation is to continue to preserve Byzantine music. Um, Byzantine music is not just uh, a nice thing to hear; it's it's part of prayer. So when you're in a church to pray, so that's kind of what kept kept me going about all this. What challenges have you faced as a chanter, and how were they overcome? Um, I would say several challenges. Um, First and foremost, probably, if, if I'm going to go back to when I, you know, started in my younger years, for example, not a lot of people knew how to chant. So, uh, and those that did come up to the chanter stand, to the analogion, um, didn't know how to chant. Sometimes they were even tone deaf. 
And uh, after a lifetime of hearing, you know, tone deaf, you know, colleagues and trying to work with them and so forth, that's a big challenge. Um, is teaching the music and teaching the proper scales and so forth. Um, here in America, of course, probably as of the last maybe 20 years, there's this uh, uh, you know push for chanting in the English language. Uh, that's a challenge for me. Actually, it made it's probably not so much a challenge for me because I don't chant in English, mm -hmm. so I don't really get involved with it. Um, I don't agree with it, and um, I think there's a lot that's lost in um, translation. Um, you know, another challenge is trying to teach what the Greek is saying, and then why the English translation may not be the most correct. What you know? certain efforts do you think could be done in order to open the full meaning of the text to every listener? I mean, every, every Greek Orthodox Church practically in this country has a book in the pew. Greek on one side, English on the other. Some of the more sophisticated volumes have Greek uh, phonetics, right? Greek phonetics, and then the English translation. Um, we could provide, you know, now we have the iPhones. Now we have the digital chant stand that's available to everybody with an iPhone that the Archdiocese has. I think that we could provide people with numerous tools. The problem is that you, you can't use those tools on the fly in, in church during service. You're never going to understand, even hearing it in English. I, and that's, that's my challenge to someone to prove to me that you can understand. Um, people don't seem to want to do homework. You know, you, you've got to read, read the liturgy. Um, Understand the word. Read the Greek and then read the English translation. There, there are some decent translations out there, um, but not ones that are matched to music. You know that you can chant in English. Uh, there's a lot that's lost in that type of a translation. You know. I must say, from my own uh, study in seminary, that I always benefited from not only reading the English translation but looking up the meaning of the original Greek text, which right. definitely uh, expounded and great, gave greater depth to the text. Right, exactly. Well, Greek was the original language. Uh, if you really want to know what something means, you have to go to the original language. Um, I, I'm not really impressed with a lot of the English translations that are out there. Having said that, I believe they are a great help. I, I will not discount them for being a study aid, for lack of a better word. Um, and whatever might be lacking, someone can easily ask their priest or ask a, a chanter. You know, what, I came across this. Is the translation? Is this correct? You know, um, we we have this huge challenge in this country with certain you know congregants wanting to hear it in English, and others that. Even converts, they want to hear it in the original Greek. There's, I think there's more converts that want the original Greek rather than the English. Um, at least that's what I've come across. Um, because, I, and I don't think there ever will be a perfect translation. I, I don't, unless the English language radically changes, I don't foresee that happening. Not in my lifetime, maybe not even in my grandkids' lifetime. You know, There has to be a huge language change in order for, for that to happen. Um, it only goes to show the great need for catechetical work. Yes, absolutely. Bible studies, even, even, okay, a lot of priests hold Bible studies, which is great. How about hymnology studies, where the chanter can lead such a group and say, here's what we're chanting this Sunday. Here's the hymn for the, the, uh, the Sunday of the prodigal son, which happens to be today. Um, what does this mean? What is the chanter chanting here? Why does the melody go up high in this phrase and then it goes down low in the other phrase? Colorizing of text has a tradition behind that as well. Um, I, I'm in the process of writing an article, which I have, it's been in the process for five years now and I have not released it. I was originally gonna put it in, a, in on, on my blog <laughs> and um, I have a feeling it's gonna turn into a small book. Uh, and that is the use of the English language in liturgical worship in the Orthodox Church. Um, 
you know, it's no secret that I'm, I'm, I'm opposed to it, I'm not in favor of it, but I give my reasons why. Um, and all of the arguments that I've heard, you know, all my lifetime about English, I basically address in this, uh, in this article. So, some people, you know, some people, you know, uh, are, wow, that's interesting. Other people are like, Oh, oh, I've been called an anglophobe. <laughs> I've been, yeah, I've been called, it's like, no, you don't understand. And there are times where I do agree with the use of English. The Lord's Prayer, the Creed, the Epistle, the Gospel must be in English. The Sermon absolutely has to be in English. You know, this whole thing about uh, preaching in the language of the people, I'm not going to discount that. Absolutely, English should be. When you get to hymnology and the chanting of these hymns, where since time immemorial there's been a marriage between the Byzantine music system and the Greek language, to try to divorce that and, and shove another and replace it with another language or even another musical system, you are diluting the whole um, experience, the experience of Byzantine chant of, of of hymnology within the framework of the services whether it's the Divine Liturgy, whether it's a simple blessing of the waters, you know. So, uh, I, I try to be tactful, I try to, you know. <laughs> Are there, it's surely that any translation that's conducted is kind of trying to fit something that is like a square peg inside of a triangular hole. Correct. So it's not going to quite fit exactly. Yeah. However, are there any translations that you've seen and you actually looked at that translation and said, you know, that one actually works. Yeah, actually works. Um, I, I have to admit, I haven't studied it enough to be able to answer your question with 100% certainty. Sure. I've seen a lot of translations. There's two schools of thoughts with translation. Sure. School of thought number one, keep the original melodies the original notes right from the classical music books of Byzantine chant. I'm talking about books from the 1800s that were first published on the printing press. The classical volumes, the Anastasimatari, the Irmologium, the Doxestario, from Petros the Peloponnesios. Keep all the music intact and then rework the English in order to fit that music so that Ti per Majo sounds like Ti per Majo except now there's just another language that fits into it. Uh, that school of thought uh, is mostly, was mostly done by Father Seraphim Dedes. He's the one that actually started the digital chant stand that the Archdiocese now, now has. Um, I, I, in, in, with all due respect to Father Seraphim, who, who did a monumental work with this project, um, I think that the translations fell short. They were awkward in a lot of ways, and they, um, they, they didn't fit properly, words were not translated properly, there were fill-in words that had to be used because of the different syllabic structure of Greek and English. Um, did it work? It, it, it worked, it did work, but not to perfection, you know. Um, school of thought number two is to take a good translation, a, a grammatically correct translation that someone can understand, and then using the rules of Byzantine hymnology in terms of syllabic structure and cadences and musical phrases, adapt those to the new English translation. The danger to that is that in a lot of cases, um, the, the Although you'll have a nice sound translation, ti per majo will now no longer sound like ti per majo. It'll kind of sound like ti per majo, but it'll have some differences that had to be made in order to accommodate the English you know, language. English and Greek are, are radically different, syllabically, structurally, mm -hmm. uh, grammatically, and, and to, to try to uh, you know, force that in the hymnology that we that's been passed down to us, if this were something brand new, there we wouldn't even be having this discussion. But it's not brand new. We're trying to maintain a tradition of hymnology that's been passed down to, you know, from from bishop to priest, from priest to chanter, from teacher chanter to student chanter. It's it's been you know it's it's something that's been around that I believe needs to be preserved. Right. Because yeah. 
I'm really inclined to agree with you. I've always thought that way. And I think the logic from the people that decided to do this is like, we want to make this accessible, but people don't have to learn Greek to right. understand the specific <coughs> hymns and chants that they're hearing. They just have to uh, learn and understand what those specific hymns are. So you don't need to know the entire language. Correct. Um, my question to you is, what do you think is really, because, you know, talking about accessibility and uh, the Orthodox Church in these modern times wants to, to Greek families that have traditionally, as well as new converts, they want to bring new people. So I think that's, we want to make it accessible, but mm -hmm. what do you think is lost in translation for both Greeks, but also maybe especially like new generations and new converts that are entering the church that they are missing out on to not have the experience of just the original Greek. Right. Uh, very good question, and I like the fact that you use the word experience, and I'll, and I'll get to that in a second, because that's kind of one of the things in, my, in this article I've been writing for five years that, uh, that, that I actually focus on, and, and which is a major difference. So, what's missing in translation? Number one, it's the mere structure of the language. Yeah. It, you're never going to get a perfect hit. Not every word in Greek can be translated into English. Mm -hmm. How do you translate the word Theotokos? <laughs> bearer of God, God-bearer, which is why I uh, always harp on some sort of Bible study, some sort of reading, some sort of, <clears throat> um, you know, speak with a chanter, speak with your priest, have these discussions so that you understand outside of the liturgy, outside of the church, what something means. The resources are surely there. People simply have to Oh yeah, seek. absolutely. And, and there's a lot of resources, even on the internet, free of charge, <laughs> you know. And, and you're correct, they're there. Coming then into church with this understanding, oh, now I know what that means. Now I know what this hymn is saying. Now you're in church and you hear the hymn, you focus on prayer. You focus on prayer. Byzantine music is not just some guy showing off his voice or some guy showing you how he can do all kinds of intricate maneuvers with this hymn or that hymn or, or having a whole bunch of people together as a choir, which does sound beautiful. It's about prayer. If I couldn't you, agree with you more. If, if the chanter or even the choir, I, I was the choir director in Philadelphia at the Cathedral of Philadelphia, St. George, Center City, when I was um, uh, hired there back in 2000. And I, and I was up having rehearsal with them, one of my first rehearsals, and I said, can anyone tell me what is our role here? And they looked at me like I had three heads, and finally they started speaking up. Well, uh, we're supposed to sing you know, these hymns of the liturgy. Yes, that's true, what else? What's our, but what's our main role? Uh, well, we're responding to the priest's petitions. Yes, yes, but what's the main purpose that we're up here? All of that, yeah, that's what we are, we're a choir. We're gonna be doing it, but what's the main purpose? And after the crickets died out, I said, I'm gonna give you the answer. We only really have one role here, and that role is to help those people down there to pray. If we can't do that, let's just pack it up and, and call it a day, because we're wasting our time here. This is not about, you know, the Sopranos showing off their range. This is not about all the syncopation we can do with some of these cool um, uh, uh, compositions that have been written you know, over the years for the American audience. This is about prayer. And you'd be hard pressed to find <clears throat> a good um, prayerful atmosphere when you have that kind of choir versus a good Byzantine choir, or Byzantine chanter. That's what I try to get across to people that have these kinds of discussions with me. Okay. And that's the biggest challenge, you know, is getting them to understand that. The Orthodox Church is not about understanding. That's a very pietistic uh, uh, thought about, about church. We are more of an experiential church, you know. In your personal experience, especially as someone whose family is from Greece, you said your father was born and is from Thessaloniki. Yeah. Um, what are the challenges, you know, not just challenges, also, you know, positive, like, learning experiences, not just about difficulty, mm -hmm. of being a chanter, you know, doing this and helping and teaching people mm -hmm. in the West, mm -hmm. where not everyone is even necessarily from a Christian background that's coming right. to this, uh, but even the mo majority of Christians in the United States mm -hmm. are not in this tradition, right. obviously, not in Orthodoxy. So, um... 
my, both of my parents were from Greece. Uh, I was born in the United States. My first language was actually Greek because that's what we spoke in the house, okay? Um, to this day, I do not speak English to my mother, for example. Uh, Dad was fluent in both languages and he preached in both languages as well. Um, uh, my mom never really learned the, the English language and it's, it's, it's painful to speak, try to speak to her in English, you know. So I've always had the Greek. Um, back in the day, there was never a discussion about chanting in English, even with my dad. Mm -hmm. uh, when I, when I, after I was a teenager and even when I was into my teens, the subject was brought up somewhere, I don't remember. Um, my dad wasn't really, you know, having come from a Byzantine music background, he wasn't that keen on it. And what he would do, I, may, maybe it was in, in a mocking way, but not really. It was, it was actually an exercise for me. Sort of a novel idea. He said, he would get the newspaper. And he said, uh, first he started with the Greek newspaper. Here's the Greek paper. Read, the, chant this article in tone so-and-so. I'm like, really? And he goes, yeah. You can read Greek, you know the syllables. I said, okay. And I went ahead and ch chanted an article about the Prime Minister in Greece who did this and whatever, did that, and it was, uh, and I cadenced everywhere I was supposed to and on the periods and all that. And if I made a mistake, my dad would stop me and say, okay, why did you do this? It'd be better if it sounded this way, you know? So it was a learning experience. And then he, after a number of years, he gave me the same exercise in English. And, uh, and I did it just to play the game. And I said, it doesn't sound right. He goes, it's because the language is not conducive to chanting. The language itself, it's, English is a, is a low Germanic language that is, sounds harsh to the ear. It's not like Arabic. There's a lot of wonderful Arabic chanters. Arabic is a different type of language. Um, with regards to trying to promote this type of music, um, I think it's possible with the right, with the right um, um, presentation. You guys, I know, probably don't remember, but a number of you, you might remember, a number of years ago, there was a CD that became a bestseller. I think the name of the CD was called Chant, if I recall. It had a light blue background, and it was made by the Benedictine monks. Do you remember this CD? Vaguely. Vaguely. It was huge. I mean, this this was Gregorian chant is what it was. It was the Benedictine mm -hmm. monks, and it was in Latin or, or whatever. I, there might have been a couple of English thrown in. It became such a bestseller. Young people were buying this CD to listen to this chanting, and and I even heard comments that, oh, I put this on when I want to pray. I'm like, that's what we gotta do, <laughs> you know. And and I think I think our music is more superior. Than, than Gregorian chant. Gregorian chant to me is very monotonous. It's very dull. Okay. Whereas melodically, the, the, the chants in our church, in the Greek church, uh, in the Orthodox church, if they're chanted properly, they're much more melodic and they're much more engaging. Uh, melody, uh, uh, musical phrases go high to accent heaven or to accent glory or to accent something positive. They go down and even in uh, uh, chromatic scales, when we talk about the devil, when we talk about Hades, when we talk about sin, the words of the hymn are painted by color, you know, which is basically the, the, the musical color, depending on what the context is. So I think if we can get that across to a brand new convert, who has no clue what orthodoxy is, what Eastern orthodoxy is, came from even an evangelical background or a Baptist, um, even a Roman Catholic background. If we can get them to understand what this is and why we do it, I think we got a shot at it. Besides your father, because we're okay. gonna get to that, right. who else have been great teachers and influences? Can you tell a little about how they affected you? My biggest influence came at 13 years old, when my father played for me a reel-to-reel -reel recording of the great Archon Protopsantis of the Patriarch, Mr. Thrasybulos Danitsas. And I asked my dad, I said, who's that? 
and he and his eyes widened up and he says, oh, that's the best chanter that there is. The Stanitsas was still living at the time, but he was not in, he had already left Constantinople because of the, um, uh, because of the, uh, what do they do when they kick him out? Uh, yeah, exactly. So he was now in Greece. But he was, he's the Otkul Protopsalti, so the ecumenical patriarchate, he's, he left since 1964. And I said, really, what's his name? And he says, his name is Thrasybulos Stanitsas. I've never heard the word Thrasybulos in my life. Thrasybulos, what kind of a name is that? I said, he goes, it's no, and it's a, yeah. So I listened to one, he was, at that point he was chanting, I think, hymns from, uh, hymns from today, from the uh, Prodigal Son Sunday. And the Doxastiko mesmerized me. The doxology afterwards, remember? And then there was, he had to put on another recording where for the first time I heard the doxology in Varis of Hormuzios. My dad says, oh, we don't chant that doxology. He expects for two special occasions during the year. I said, really? <laughs> he goes, yeah, you have, you're have. you never gonna be able to chant this until you're 30 years old. I said, I'm gonna prove you wrong, I told him. But ever since that exposure to Stanitas, I started listening to only Stanitsas. It was as if he was my teacher. I never met him in person. Wow. Never met him in person. I, I spoke to him on the phone many times. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I spoke, at one time he even gave me a little bit of a lesson over the phone, because I said, please just chant this, I wanna hear it. Well, okay, you know, and he reluctantly, but he did it for me. It was some, something that had to do with one of the nooms that, that, that changed the, um, the, 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 the tetra chord. And when he did it, I immediately knew what, what was going on, you know. So uh, despite the fact that I never met him, I never really spent time with him, I, I humbly dare to call him my teacher. Definitely know? a blessing to have been able to speak with him on the phone. Yeah, exactly. He taught exactly. You. I think he definitely did teach you. Yeah, yeah I, uh, I, you know, I commemorate his name along with my family's name, you know, uh, for the repose of his soul because it's because of him. I mean, my, again, my father first, but Stanitsas really ignited this, this, this fire to maintain the patriarchal tradition. I said, I want to chant just like him, or at least try to, because every other chanter at that point that I had heard, I, I couldn't unsee. It was, it was like night and day. And I, well, Stanitsas didn't do it this way. Well, there's more chanters besides Stanitsas. Yes, but this is the right way. You know, I, that's the mentality I had. And, uh, uh, and now after he's gone, unfortunately, now everybody's like, oh, Stanitsas this, Stanitsas that. Whereas when he first came to Greece, they would call him a Turk up and down. They were afraid that he was gonna take their spot after he left Turkey. And he never became, went to take anybody's spot. He went to a church that, was, that just simply happened to have an opening and he stayed there for the rest of his career until he retired. So, uh, and he had a very good choir. He taught a lot of people while he was in Greece, and those that really understood flocked to him. You know, I think some of the recordings that I've heard had him chanting with other people from the congregation. Yeah, you could hear congregation. You could hear people in the congregation trying to chant with him. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I mean, they just got to know him where he was at Saint right. Demetrius at that church, and. Uh, he tried to do things a little differently every time because when you're at the Patriarchate, you have to chant the same thing every time. The same Luxus the same, uh, th there's a tradition there that you stick to and you don't deviate. When he went to Athens, um, he finally had an opportunity now to kind of express himself, still staying in line with patriarchal tradition, but now he made a couple of changes. He would change this melody a little bit. He would add this little inflection or intonation or what, what they call a figura, which is a uh, a little uh, a little dressing of the of the you know music of, of the word of the uh, sounds like figure. Yeah, exactly. A figura is a is a uh, is an embellishment, a little embellishment. You know, you would hear him you know do some things in there. Um, again, always in line with with his roots, and never sounding like like a like song or like you know let's break out the bazooka. This is a nightclub. Never made the church. So uh, after that, um, I, it, while I was in college, uh, I met with a, um, he used to chant at the cathedral in uh, Philadelphia, at St. George. He was another Constantinopolitan, came from Constantinople, and he was a very good chanter. When I first met him, I would tell people, this man is the best chanter in the United States of America. And I tell him to his face, he goes, no, stop. I said, that's how I viewed you. 
and I tried to learn things from him, and I did, and whenever I would get together with him, I chanted one Holy Thursday with him, uh, which I had a, have a recording of somewhere, uh, at, at St. George, and uh, he taught me a lot of things. And then, uh, and then because I had such a, I was so, uh, I, I, I had such a, a sense about the whole uh, hymnology thing, um, a lot of things I was able to study on my own. I was able to pick up a theory book or, or pick up a book written by someone else that gave their perspective on Byzantine hymnology. And if I had questions, I would ask the appropriate people. Incredible. Um, I, I got my diploma in Byzantine music thanks to the former uh, Archon First Domesticos of, uh, of the Ecumenical Patriarchate, a uh, gentleman by the name of Miltiades Papas. And Miltiades um, helped me achieve that, you know, and get that, that degree, that, that diploma. Uh, in Byzantine music, and I got that in Greece at the uh, at the conservatory. Have you also been to Constantinople? Well? I have not. Mm -hmm. I'm all I mean, as 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 a maniac as I am about Constantinople, I have not gone yet. I have not gone, but I will. <laughs> at some point, I will. Um, yeah. Jordan, uh, the other day, actually told me for the first time that for centuries the original tradition of the Byzantine chanting was. They weren't writing stuff down, they would practice, and he was also saying, you know, they had time, so they would be like an everyday thing often, where they would just, every day they would practice, practice. Right. And I was wondering if you could say a word for people who are learning and practicing now about, despite the fact that, like, you know, praise God, we have the internet, we have paper, we have, these are useful tools, yes. but, like, do you think that there's a way kind of to maintain that essence of like just really soaking it in until it's like second nature and not letting the other methods of learning as useful as they can be necessarily detract from us having that experience that those you know long time ago chanters had right so i'm, I'm gonna i'm gonna start the answer to your question which is a very good question with a conversation that i had with Mr. Miltiades Papas, the former Archon first. The first Domesticos is the immediate first helper to the Protopsaldis. The second Domesticos is the immediate helper of the Lambadarios, the leader of the left choir, okay? So uh, Miltiades went to the Patriarchate and was there for 10 years and achieved that rank of uh, uh, first Domesticos. I asked him a question one time because this was another blog article I was thinking of doing. And, and I said, what books of Byzantine chant should a serious student or lover of Byzantine music have on his bookshelf? I was shocked at the answer, but then I understood why when he explained it. His answer was, none of them. I said, wait a minute. He, said, he says, I'm not waiting any minute. None of them, you don't need books. And I said, why not? How are you going to learn? You're going to hear it from your teacher. That's how you learn. After that, books become useless. I said, even the long, you know, the cherubic hymns, and the, even those. But the tradition of the patriarchal chanters is to chant uh, ex titus, which means from, uh, by heart. Now, they might learn from a book, okay, but even that book, the teacher has it up here and is teaching the student. As long as you're at the chanter stand with the teacher, with the protopsalti, and you, and you go through one, two, three, four liturgical cycles, you're gonna start picking up what's going on. And a lot of this will be, will be you'll, you'll know everything by heart. Holy Week, the only reason I put a book in front of me is for the guys around me to see what I'm doing. That's the only reason, otherwise I don't need a book, you know, music book. So he said, no music books. You live, I said, but we don't have teachers here in America. He didn't want to hear it. Well, go find a teacher. <laughs> like, so easier said than done. But now to get to your answer, having, having said that, which is, which is probably the most correct answer, what books do I need? Well, none of them. You have to hear everything from your teacher. So now we have a, a challenge. We have a problem here in this country, in America, where we don't have enough, I, I'm not gonna discount everybody because there are some good chanters here of old time that have passed through, but there's not enough of them. They can't cover all the ground. So how do you do it? Um, thank God for YouTube. Thank God for the internet. Um, 
I, I have a, an email that I actually set up as a template because I get asked a lot of the questions. I want to start hearing, I want to start learning. The only way you're gonna start learning is by listening. And you have to listen to the proper stuff. If you don't listen to the proper stuff, you're gonna get straight. You can't listen to a pop singer who pretends to know Byzantine chant and starts chanting hymnology and, and expect that you're gonna do it the right way. This is a pop singer that's doing this for money, to sell CDs, and, and to, you know, to, to stand on stage in a semi-messianic pose and you know, try to convince the people that this is correct. So, like I said, I have this, this email template that I send out to people, and it says, here's who you should be listening to. This name, that name, that name, that name. Here's some links. Here's where you can hear them. Modern day people that are still alive, this one, that one, that one. These are all, these are all sons or grandchildren of the great patriarchal chanters. Choirs only listen to this choir, that choir, or that. I think the list is only three choirs long for Byzantine choirs. All the rest, they take a lot of liberties. And I include even links, okay? Go listen here, go listen there, and then just do a Google search or do a YouTube search. Yeah. As long as you're listening to the proper people, you can hear this stuff. You can even start chanting along with it. And that's probably the next best thing to having a live teacher at your beck and call whenever you play. For sure. You know, uh, I, I've tried finding solutions for people because they're out in the Midwest or, they're, or, or even they're in New York and I'm in New Jersey. You know, I, I can't meet with them every single day. Come to my church. I can't. I have to be at this church with my parents or whatever. Um, so I try to find solutions and maybe use some technology and, and stuff that's available out there. Just be careful is, is what I basically tell them. Huh. You know? Yeah, I think the internet's just an invaluable resource and nothing yeah. beats learning from a real person. Yes. But like any time on command, we can just listen to not just like one chanter, but just like we can access to so many things right. that we never would be able to otherwise. So. The uh, live recordings are probably preferable than studio recordings. Yeah. Because studio recordings, sometimes they slow the tempo down mm. a little bit. Where in reality, if you were in a church in actual practice, it would be like, you know, you don't chant a canon. Play go first. That's not how the canon is chanted. In, in actual practice, it would be There's a tempo, there's a certain tempo to it. It's great for the CD and the recording and the, and the presentation when they're at a concert, but not in actual practice. So the live recordings, I usually tell people, seek the live recordings of these chanters if you can. Sure. Yeah. Um, and uh, it, I mean, you'll just, Again, it's the next best thing. You'll learn a lot. There's plenty of stuff available. And um, I just tell people, if you can't find something, let me know. I'll record it for you. <laughs> Whatever. What are some of your favorite hymns? Or okay. Days? Favorite hymns and feast days and experiences. Holy Week, hands down. Yeah. Holy Week to me. My father used to say as a priest, I live my life for Holy Week. I couldn't kind of really understand because what he meant by that exactly growing up because I barely saw my father during Holy Week. You know, he was a church. If I wanted to see my dad during Holy Week, I had to go to church. And I was in church. Um, but once I started understanding what these hymns mean, there's some hymns I, I can't even chant anymore right. because they're very emotional to me. Uh, there are certain readings I can't even read without breaking down into tears. Isaiah 53, I think it is, where he talks about like a lamb that was led to slaughter. And I start reading that and, I, and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to swallow my tears, you know. Um, so hands down, the, um, the hymns of Holy Week are extremely personal to me, um, which is why the Holy Week concert that I would direct is probably my favorite thing to do. Uh, and then of course the hymns of the Panagia, because of her role in our salvation, are, are important. Um, the last question. Um, what advice to people just starting out? Oh, uh, listen and then listen some more, and then when you're done listening, go back and start listening again. Listen and listen and listen. That's the only, and I'm talking about someone now that wants to get involved chanting, okay? Um, you have to listen, you know, to these, to these chanters and how they, how they execute the hymnology. 
for the average Orthodox Christian that's coming into Orthodoxy, um, read. Read a lot. Read the proper books. You know, read uh, Timothy Ware's book on the Orthodox Church. Read uh, in, in advanced readings. Even read the Philokalia. You know, sure. um, there's a lot of resources. There, there's nothing that's been left uh, to question in Orthodoxy. Everything has been answered. Your father, he just seems like such a fascinating character. And there's obviously not enough time to just say all of the things you learned from him and how that informed your experience. But beyond the fact that he helped you to learn to the extent, of course, you had to do a lot of work on your own for that, but he was just a great influence when it came to that. Sure. But I was just interested, his life story and personality, how both that imparted something on you for your life path when it comes to Orthodox Christianity, the hymns and the chanting, but also, you know, I think everyone experiences this on their personal journey where you had to be like, I can't just mimic him and walk the same path as him. What can I learn from him? But what do I also just kind of realize I have to do my own way in a way that might be different from him or even different than the way that he's telling me to do it? If you have anything to say about that. Right. I tried not to deviate so much. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't want to, because, because I knew what his background was and who he learned from. So I, I, I didn't want to just be a renegade and say, okay, you taught me up to here, but now I'm going to take it further because I don't think you can do this, I'm going to go this path. Because now that opens up dangers in modifying and, and, and uh, uh, doing stuff that, that's really out of, that you're not supposed to be doing in hymnology. So hymnology was what I was into. <clears throat> and, um, and I wanted to make sure that I was chanting properly. Um, in the beginning, I did chant some stuff uh, that was uh, a little more expressive than what it should have been. And once I started learning about the history and what the patriarchals did and so forth, I did tone things down a little bit, um, and I and I chanted more properly. You know, um, my dad's influence is because his teacher was a protopsalvis of the patriarchate, so um, and he tried to use that in his even in his ministry as a priest to to to, to incorporate some of that style of chanting. In, in what he did, and that encouraged me as well. So whatever I sought beyond the capabilities of my dad, uh, I always I always made sure that w where I was going was somebody that was in line with what I had already been taught. Yeah, yeah. And, and I don't try to uh, to downplay it to say, oh, you know, you'll learn it. Okay, yes, you'll learn it, but you do have to immerse yourself in it. But let me give you a guide. You know, here's where you need to go. Here's what you need to listen to. Here's why certain things are done the way that they're done kind of like a crash course in discussing this stuff with people that have not grown up with it, I can at least try to get them to understand what's going on, you know, and why certain things are done the way they're done, you know. Um, but yeah, he, I mean, he influenced me a lot, and uh, again, because of his background, and uh, um, I, I, and there was a time where I wanted to be a priest just like him. Yeah, when I was a kid, yeah, what do you want to be when you grow up? I want to be a priest. I want to be a priest. I, and then after I started realizing that there was a lot of politics involved, yeah. that I probably didn't want to get to it. And then, and then, of course, by that time, I had already learned a lot in terms of chanting, and I loved it so much, I just made a decision like, look, I think my calling is more at this uh, lecture you know, than at that one over there, you know. So that's kind of what... It's definitely a beautiful path you're taking. Yeah. We want to thank you for allowing us to conduct this interview. And we want to encourage all of our watchers to like and subscribe. And we thank you for staying for this interview. And uh, until next time, we appreciate you uh, being here today. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it.